Hey folks, Frank the Pest Geek here. Hey, we've been told that the label is the law. Really? Is the label the law or is the labeling the law? And you know what? I spent nine years going to CEU classes and nobody ever explained the labeling. And everyone told me the label is the law. We're going to look at the actual law and clarify this. Check this out. So I'm here at the EPA website where the law comes from. And what we're looking at is this introduction to pesticide labels. There's a link up top. I'm going to have a link in the video. You can get it. And we're going to look at this. Give me a second for that to update. There we go. And go a little bit lower. Introduction to pesticide labels. Pesticide product labels provide critical information about how to safely and legally handle and use pesticide products. Unlike most other types of product labels, pesticide labels are legally enforceable. And all of them carry the statement, it is a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its what? Labeling. And then it says, in other words, the label is the law. Wait a minute. We've heard this over and over and over and over. The label is the law. I mean, people parrot it. The label is the law. How do you apply this product? The label is the law. How do you use the product? The label is the law. Yet I put a challenge out on Facebook for somebody to answer a challenge question. And so far, two people answered it. The problem is they answered it wrong. How can you be so right, Frank? Because it tells you right there in the legal statement, inconsistent with its labeling. Well, we now have to go down to page. State and federal agencies enforce pesticide label requirements. Educational programs certified pesticide users and pesticide users read and follow label directions. Again, it says labeling in the law, but they're referring to the label. Well, let's look at pesticide regulation and labels. And we all know that this is where the code is of what is required to be on the label right there. If you want to know what the federal requirement is, what has to be on a label, CFR 40 part 156 tells manufacturers there is an actual manual. I think it's 200 pages long that tells manufacturers how to create a product label. And then you get down to what is the difference between what is the difference between the label and the labeling. Let's go down over here so that you can see and get a little lower. Now, under FIFRA law, section 2P defines the label as follows. Label. The term label is defined as the written, printed, or graphic matter on or attached to the pesticide or device or any of its containers or wrappers. Labeling. Let me let it go up a little bit. The term labeling is defined as all labels. Listen, all labels and all other written printed graphic matter accompanying a pesticide or device at any time or B to which reference is made on the label or in literature accompany the pesticide or device except to current official publications of the Environmental Protection of the United States Department of Agriculture the interior and interior and the department of health and human services state experiment stations state agricultural colleges and other similar federal state institutions or agency authorized by law to conduct research in field pesticides now if you read labeling you will notice everything refers to labels why? Well, look at 
look at the disclaimer at the bottom. Right here. I'm going to highlight it for you. Let me see if I can do that. Got two computers here going. There you go. In these web pages, we just read the pages regarding, we have used the term label for simplicity. Please read it to include other materials that are considered labeling. What? Yeah. The term label, because when you read your SDS and you read the HCS law, they refer to the SDS as label, not the pesticide label. When you read the law in HDS and HCS training, it states the label and they're referring to the label and you could get easily confused thinking it's referring to the PESTA. No, when HCS uses it, when the global harmonized system, it refers to the label as the HDS. So in other words, in these webpages, we have used the term label for simplicity. Please read it to include other materials that are considered labeling. In other words, the label is not the law. The labeling is the law. And that includes the SDS is part of the law. How do we know this? Because they tell us. This is from 1992, October 9, 1992. Let's look at section one. I'm going to, I'm going to make this bigger for you. Background and rationale. Let's read the whole thing. Subject, material safety data sheet as pesticide labeling. This notice describes EPA's interpretation that the material safety data sheet, MSDS, may accompany a pesticide or device without approval from EPA, as long as it does not conflict with the approval pesticide labeling. What? It doesn't say pesticide label. It says the approved accompanied Pesticide labeling. This policy is effective immediately. FIFRA section 2P 2A defines labeling as all labels and all other written, printed, or graphic matter accompanying a pesticide or device at any time. Therefore, an MSDS which accompanies a pesticide product is labeling they further clarified it during april 12 or april 20th of 2012 let me let you get there there you go pr notice updates and defines and clarifies determination in pr 94-2 that a material safety data sheet, MSDS, also referred as safety data sheets because the name changed, that accompanies a pesticide product is considered part of the pesticide's labeling, but may accompany a pesticide product without, without notification to or approval by the agency provides such labeling is consistent with CFR Part 156 of the labeling requirements. So now, is the label the law or is the labeling the law? The reality is it is the labeling. You must read the pesticide label on how to apply it. And then you also must read the MSDS and every other supplemental label that the manufacturer puts out. Not just the label. You're saying, but... The label tells me how to apply it. The MSDS or the SDS is only for if there's a spill or is there a fire or an accident. It is not. That is only one part of it for DOT. 
The other part is written for OSHA requirements. And if you have employees, they fall under OSHA. And there's additional instructions for them outside of the label. And we're going to take a look at this. I'm going to pick one label to show you how this can get so confusing. We're going to go directly to the horse's mouth. We're going to go to Zoecon. This is a product that I absolutely love. We use this product extensively. We use it, a lot of this product, to the tune of, I don't know, maybe 20 gallons a year plus Ecovia EC, plus Ecovia MT. Understand that I am fanatical about using lower reduced risk products and using eco-friendly products and using natural products as much as possible whenever possible according to the labeling and this is why I, i'm bringing this up there is absolutely nothing wrong with this product but great now i have to save it let me let me go ahead and open this product all right here is IC3, Essentria IC3. And what you got to understand that the label deals with the application of a solution while the SDS deals with the material being transported and handled in a concentrated form. This is neither a criticism nor an endorsement of the product. It is what it is. Notice in the label, when we look at the PPE, right here, it says personal protective equipment, PPE, persons, let me make this a little bigger so you can see it. There you go. Persons handling concentrate are required to wear protective eyewear, chemical resistant gloves made of neoprene, nitrile, and rubber or natural rubber. Notice it says handling. Once you have mixed it, there is no longer a need to wear PPE according to the label. Here is what is not on the label. This statement. Right here. It's not on the label. It is a violation of federal law let me let you see it. It's a violation of federal law to use this product in a matter inconsistent with his labeling. It's not there. It's not on the product. It's not on this label. Therefore, do you still... Well, is there a violation of federal law if you don't do it the way the label says because it's not on the label? It's a caution label, meaning the LD50 is really low on this. It is considered safe. It is considered grass, generally regarded as safe. There is, however, a statement on this label which tells you And here is the problem. Where is it? All right. Right down here in the label, when fogging, okay, when fogging, close or shut off air conditioning and ventilating equipment. Okay, but that's on pretty much all labels. Yes, it is. Here's the problem. Let's go to the SDS. The SDS, we don't need to read it because it has nothing to do with application. Well, according to the pictogram, this product, when handled in its raw form, may cause drowsiness, 
may cause damage, fertility, or unborn, may have allergic reaction, cause serious damage to eyes, cause irritation, may be fatal if swallowed, or, entry, or if in entryways. So you're making a concentration, and it says here, avoid breathing fume, gas, mist, or vapors. However, there is no PPE requirement on the label for a respirator. None. Responsibility is the only word buyer assumes the responsibility for safety and use, not in accordance with label directions on this statement. This product is exempt from FIFRA registration. Yet, it has an SDS, which is a federal document under OSHA and DOT. So now, it says, wash hands thoroughly beforehand. Do not drink or smoke. Use only outdoors. Use only outdoors or in well-ventilated areas. Why do you think you keep hearing me say for the last six years that I've been talking about 25B products that I'm not a fan of putting these products indoors? People can get really offended by the odors. The odors can be very offensive. But it says use only. There's a precautionary statement. Under the GHS, under the US, which is right there. Well-ventilated areas. So if you're inside of the home and you have shut off the air conditioner, everything is closed, it isn't ventilated, then you need to wear, do you need to wear a respirator? Yes, according to this, you do. I'm going to show it to you. There it is. Respiratory individual protection, personal protection equipment that is not on the label is right there on your SDS. In case of insufficient ventilation, use NIOSH approved respirator protection. This is the law. This is the labeling. You just read it with me. This is not on the label, yet it, be, it involves worker protection. The label says, here's what we're going to read on the label. Where is the first aid? There we go. If inhaled, move exposed person to fresh air. If breathing problems persist, get medical attention. Now, I want you to answer this question for me. You're a tech. You're by yourself. Everybody left that house. You're getting ready to fog it. And you're not wearing a respirator because there's no respirator required on the label. And therefore, I don't have to wear it. Now, my question is, if it causes breathing problems, causes dizziness, you get exposed to it and you're inside a enclosed home and you fall or you pass out, who's going to drag you out? Because this is assuming that you're working in an agricultural environment and you're working with a team or you're working with somebody else. 99% of the time we are by ourselves working. Yet it says nothing about a respirator. And most of the guys that I talk to who are solo operators are going to tell me I don't have to read the SDS because that is for, you know, in case there's a fire, in case there's a spill, I got to give that over to the first responder. Yes, you do. But wear chemical resistant gloves. Individual protective measures, goggles, and face shield. It is recommended for handlers to wear appropriate clothing to prevent contact with skin and shoes. But in case of insufficient ventilation, use a NIOSH respirator. So you're going to tell me that because it wasn't on the label, you don't have to use it. But if your worker gets injured 
and falls in a home because he didn't read the SDS, whose fault is that? And that is what I'm trying to talk about. And this is everybody gets mad at me and upset when I bring up these challenges because nobody wants to deal with this because 95% of you listening to me don't have employees. But it's common sense. Common sense to who? Since when is common sense law? Since if it was common sense, there would no, be no need to write this article because everybody would be wearing a respirator if they apply this indoor. You see, outdoor doesn't seem to be a problem. It doesn't seem to be a problem mixing it outdoor. It doesn't seem to be a problem on the label when you apply it. I've had customers that I've told, listen, I've applied it at the lowest label rate. I've told the customer, this really smells, you could be offended by it. And they said, go ahead, I want you to use it. I was reading on it. I want you to use IC3. I want you to use EcoV. I want you to use all these products. And I said, okay, I'm going to do it. And I did a baseboard spray and a cracking crevice. We were dealing with ticks. And two minutes later, I can't breathe. I need to open up the windows and ventilate the house. And the product wasn't even that strong. And people are sensitive. This is why I have these issues with doing what I've been saying for six years that I've, until I'm blue in the face about what it is that we're applying, how we're applying it, and what we need to know. And the problem is when I get the answer that 90% disagree with me, when the label, I'm reading you the law from the EPA directly, I'm going to the label and showing you an example of where things aren't always clear. They're not clear cut. Where this whole issue with SDS and label, and I spent nine years taking CEU course before somebody even explained this to me. And I'm trying to explain it, and most of you can do is get pissed at me. You see, folks, this is why I'm your pest geek. I see things, and they just pop out at me, and I said, something ain't right. Something in the milk ain't clean. Something doesn't feel right. We really need to get better training. Training available to everyone. This is why HCS and GHS and the label training and the SDS training is now mandatory. We got a mandatory law that everybody has to learn this in every, everybody who handles chemicals, not just in the pest control field. And again... The products are what they are. They've been registered. But you need to sit down with your people and read the SDS and read the GHS. We just have a policy that if you're going to mist or fog anything, period, you have to wear a respirator. Misting and fogging. For misting for mosquitoes, you've got to wear a respirator. We're going to fog inside a house for any reason. We fog thermal fog warehouses for pests with natural. You got to wear a respirator. You can't go and make an application without a respirator. This is just our standard policy because what if we miss it? So all of our techs have to wear long sleeve. All of them have to wear long pants, shoes with socks, gloves. And when they're applying these products overhead, They've got their goggles because what if we miss it? What if we get it wrong? Nobody has it right 100% of the time. We make mistakes. Trying to interpret these laws is not easy for pest control people. Sitting there and having to read when you're carrying 16 labels and having to read all, this is why most people carry one product and that's it. And they spray and pray that on everything to avoid having to memorize all of this because this is hard. This is not easy. This is training time. This is time that costs money for the company. I don't have the time to sit down for one hour on every technician when we carry 40 products and train a technician on all of these products. I need them to work and I need them to produce. 
And we have a big problem in the industry where that's all we're focused on, that the, the prices that we charge our customers to hire the right people, to train the right people, isn't there because it's a race to the bottom in the industry to be the cheapest because the customer is comparing prices and the customer is not going to care about any of this. The reality is when you explain to the customer that it takes 40 hours to train a technician just on the law alone and you can't find people to work because you got to get people and then you got to get people who really aren't going to be really legal, technical minded. We got a problem in the industry that we need to deal with. And this is why everybody's mad at me, why everybody's upset, why no, why, you know, why I'm a heretic, why I'm a chemophobe. Because I'm looking at this and going, daggone it, why I am so slow in growing that I'm knowing not growing as fast as everybody. Because you need the right people and we need to charge the right prices. And when my prices are double everybody else's and 30 to 40 percent more because I have to do it right because I don't want to take any chances with my people. I don't want to take any chances with the customer. I don't want to take any chances with the product, the property. We want to do it right and we have to charge more to do it right. This is the difference between a professional and a hack and an amateur. So when customers and companies write that you can do your own pest control for less money than what a professional charges, what do we got to say about that? We need to raise the bar. We're raising the bar. This is Frank the Pest Geek wishing you a pestacular day.